calls. But psychiatric racism wasn't exclusively American. Some of the worst abuses of the 20th century occurred in South Africa, where the government adopted the same racist theories and practices used by Hitler. This was no coincidence. The prime minister had studied eugenics as a psychology student in Nazi-influenced Germany in the 1920s. Dr. Hendrik Verwurst is regarded as the architect of apartheid. Uh, he saw South Africa as a divided state with whites, blacks and brown people living in totally separate areas with uh, black people having no rights whatsoever. With apartheid in place, psychiatrists established mental hospitals throughout the country that were in fact nothing more than slave labor camps. These places operated under a private company by the name of Smith Mitchell and Company. They were saving money through the cheap accommodation for psychiatric patients while making massive fortune out of money that Parliament had appropriated for medication. So it was a corrupt system. When this operation was finally exposed, it was discovered that 67,000 prisoners had perished. While at the same time, psychiatrists had collected $117 million in funding from the South African government. The World Health Organization issued a report declaring that psychiatry cultivated racism and that apartheid did have a parallel in the ownership and trading of slaves. In 1971, in the United States, psychiatrist Louis Jolly West continued psychiatry's legacy of racism hatching a secret aversion therapy experiment called the Violence Center. His government-funded plan, implant electrodes in the brains of African-American and Hispanic males to shock them should they exhibit any violent behavior. And if that didn't work, chemically castrate them with drugs. When West's racist proposal met with public outrage, the plan was quickly shelved. Though psychiatry's unrelenting racist theories were blunted, they were not stopped. In 1994, psychologist Richard Hernstein co-authored The Bell Curve, claiming to prove that blacks were genetically disabled and therefore inferior to whites. The Bell Curve um, really argues a very old eugenics idea. It argues that people are born with different kinds of intellectual abilities, that these are inborn pretty much at birth. It goes back to the notion that somehow black people are genetically and biologically inferior to white people as a way to justify what was really its pro programs of social racism and social sexism. And you see that kind of thinking going on in public school testing and IQ testing and educational testing and tracking. And this new tool fit into that old mold. It was a new tool that could prove the intellectual inferiority of African Americans. The psychiatric profession has done great damage, certainly in the past, and far too many in the present, too, to subvert democracy and perpetuate racial stereotypes, even more deep racism in society. We have to battle against this continual uh, misinformation, disinformation, pseudoscience, uh, it can be repackaged in whatever form or format it is, but if it is based solely upon the color of one's skin and then is the merit of that human being, I just reject it. And so today, the flame of hatred continues to burn, fueled by pseudo-scientific lies. This is the heritage of psychiatry, as a justification for racism and as a pretext for political repression. коммунистическим идеалом, убежденно, с революционной настойчивостью притворять в жизнь Ленинский завет, учиться коммунизму, трудиться самоотверженно, по-коммунистически, всей жизнью своей, утверждать на земле дело Ленина, дело партии. Ленемся! The Soviet regime demanded absolute loyalty. Those who did not toe the party line were considered dissidents and labeled enemies of the state. 
With no more than a whisper to the secret police, they would vanish into one of these special psychiatric hospitals. Despite the risks, these so-called dissidents put their ideas of freedom into action. Я вел жизнь тайную, конспиративную. Никто не знал, что я это делал. У меня была маленькая подпольная типография, и я стал делать листовки. While others considered themselves loyal Soviet citizens. Я, например, считал, это уверенно считал, что я один из лучших советских людей. Когда уже даже меня арестовали. According to Soviet psychiatrists, they all suffered from inflexibility of convictions, a symptom of a new disorder sluggish schizophrenia. Like their counterparts in other countries, the Soviet psychiatrists prescribed powerful drugs to cure their patients. Ну, они никогда их с удовольствием не принимали. И на кое пути их не принимали. Мы обязаны просмотреть прием лекарства, потому что больные лекарства дошли до больного. Вот они где-то уже, как говорится, в горле проватывают, все, ротовая полость чистая. И потом вот такие делают какие-то движения, отрыгивают. Врач на обходе говорит, как себя чувствуете, Петр Петрович? Я говорю, послушайте, вот, а, а там, э, когда э, 5 кубиков галоперидола, то надо, например, слюна до полу, там перекошенность вся, значит, одни мышцы растягиваются, другие сокращаются, совершенно ужасные позы, лицо все ужасное, на душе страшно просто. Я человека, вот самое главное, описать, описать это состояние невозможно. Санитары совершенно безнаказанно могли избивать. По любому поводу. Или вообще без повода. Вот, например, э, санитар открывает дверь. Э, и тут, э, тут ты оказался, например, в этом в проеме двери. И вот э, этого достаточно было, чтобы, скажем, получить удар. Если э, больной, э, скажем, оказывал сопротивление при избиении, то его могли привязать и привязывали, и уже избивали, и продолжали избивать уже привязанного. Проходит, допустим, год, два, там, выписывает убийц, выписывает насильников. Михаил, ты бы лучше убил бы кого-нибудь, мне бы легче было тебя отсюда вытолкнуть. Это было, вот, расстало такое чувство безысходности. From 1967 to 1987, the and were forced to undergo psychiatric treatment. Even today, psychiatry remains the coercive tool of choice for governments throughout the world. What we've learned is that in Getmo or Guantanamo Bay, that we had teams of healthcare professionals called the biscuit teams, behavioral scientists, um, psychologists, working with the military to advise them on how far you could push a, a prisoner. There are abuses that have been documented around the world. We have healthcare professionals who have committed um, potentially um, acts of treason uh, within their medical ethics and there's nobody supervising that there's nobody making them stand accountable to their medical ethics but psychiatrists have never reserved physical and mental torture exclusively for political prisoners throughout history they have repackaged it and sold it to the public as therapy Beginning in the 1920s, psychiatrists embraced a new group of procedures that claimed to work by creating intentional damage to the brain. 
Monfred Sockel had this notion that he could kill just the bad brain cells, that somehow we have good brain cells, we have bad brain cells. So if you give people enough insulin, you kill those bad brain cells. And if the person survived this epilepsy, they would be better off for it. Despite convulsions that caused severe spinal cord injuries in 40% of the patients, Sockel pointed to their childlike state and declared his treatment a success. Hospitals built insulin wards and coma therapy became big business. Not to be outdone, Ladislaus von Meduna of Hungary believed he could drive out mental illness by inducing brain damaging seizures with a drug called metrazol. He noticed his epileptics had no mental health problems and his mental health patients, his uh, psychiatric patients, seemed to have no epilepsy and so he thought doing one would obviate the other. The theory was that epilepsy and schizophrenia couldn't coexist in the same brain and that if epilepsy was induced, that a seizure was caused, it would, quote, drive out the schizophrenia. There's no scientific basis for this whatsoever. Metrazole was fast and lucrative. In a morning, a single psychiatrist could chemically shock 50 patients into a docile and manageable state. By 1939, metrazole was so popular with psychiatrists and staff, it was used in 70% of American hospitals and in almost every other country in the world. The financial success of insulin and metrazole sparked the development of an even more profitable method of inducing brain-damaging convulsions. How is electric shock therapy done? We use these electrodes. We place them on the patient's head like this. And then by means of this machine, we place a controlled electric current through the brain. Just for a fraction of a second. The patient doesn't feel it. The story behind this miracle cure began in a Roman slaughterhouse. In Italy, in 1938, uh, two uh, Italian psychiatrists decided to observe that before slaughtering pigs, in order to make the pigs more docile, they would apply electrodes to their temples that were hooked up to wall current, and uh, that this stunned the pigs, but it didn't kill them. And they could then slaughter them. Well, this gave them the encouragement to try inducing convulsions with electricity. We would see teeth falling out, broken spines, bones knocked out of joint, broken bones, and people even getting internal organ damage from being restrained while they were having these uncontrolled, writhing seizures, convulsions. Many patients have been returned to their homes and jobs who might still be here if it were not for this helpful form of treatment. Having successfully sold brain damage as a cure, psychiatrists search for even more precise ways of targeting the brain. This was jump-started in 1848, when an explosion blew a steel rod straight through the head of Vermont railway worker Phineas Gage. While Gage survived, his personality was dramatically altered. Seventy years later, Portuguese neurologist Igaz Moniz would try to obtain a similar result by drilling into a patient's skull and squirting pure alcohol directly into the brain killing the tissue of the frontal lobes. Moniz called this new procedure a lobotomy. Dr. Walter J. Freeman would become lobotomy's most infamous practitioner. He discovered he could do it faster without having to drill through the skull. There was no anesthesia and he would just lift up the eye and stick uh, nothing more than an ice pick right into the brain, right under the orbital bone and then just break the thing back and forth until he was satisfied that he had caused enough disruption of brain tissue and then pull it out. Freeman traveled the country in his lobotomobile, hacking apart his patient's brains on stage or sometimes right there in the vehicle. And he would pull up and offer lobotomies to people, get referrals from the local doctors or sometimes people didn't even go through doctors. They'd go right to the lobotomobile and he would just do the brain damaging procedure right there. 